so much for carving out some time to join together in this discussion around equity and transit oriented development, um, especially with everything going on in the country and in the capital right now. Um, we appreciate that folks are carving out space for this important discussion as we try to build a better world together. Um, this is uh, an event that's being put on by RVA Rapid Transit, uh, as well as CCAN. Um, my name is Nelson Reevely. I'm with RVA Rapid Transit as their Director of Operations. And uh, my co-collaborator, L is with CCAN and is their grassroots organizer for Central Virginia. Um, and this webinar series is broadly about the links between transportation and climate change. Um, today, we're focused in particular on housing and land use and zoning. Uh, and the ways in which those very directly tie in uh, with those broader issues of transportation and climate change. Um, and we're very fortunate to have with us today uh, Delegate Ibrahim Samira um, from the 86th District uh, up in Northern Virginia, who's been working on these issues around land use and affordable housing, um, and as well Stuart Shorts, uh, who is also uh, working up in Northern Virginia with the Coalition for Smarter Growth, um, which he's the executive director of. And Stuart's also done work as well in Richmond uh, with the Partnership for Smarter Growth, where he's uh, on the board um, and then their policy, as their policy chair. Um, I wanted to make one housekeeping note. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity uh, for question and answer um, on kind of the second half of the event. If you've got questions as folks are presenting, because um, Stuart and the delegate are both gonna give uh, presentations to start us out. If you have questions, just throw them up in the chat um, and you can do that as the presentations are going. And then clearly once the presentations are done as well, if questions arise, um, please just put them in the chat and we'll, we'll get those um, out and discussion flowing around them. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Stuart who is gonna kick us off with his presentation. Uh, thank you all. I'm really pleased to, to be here. I see a lot of veterans here as well as some new names uh, to, to me uh, working. It looks like folks from the planning, transportation, uh, conservation, advocacy sectors throughout. I have a presentation here. It's going to be somewhat DC centric to some extent because I don't have as many great pictures and slides for the Richmond region, but I'd be happy to talk about the Richmond region and some of the initiatives there. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I now hear our pup, my pup uh, contributing to the conversation here in the background. I'm going to go to share my screen. And uh, as is typical when so much is going on, and I'm sorry, I was distracted by as everybody was yesterday. So it's a little bit longer than I would think. And I'll skip over some slides to, to shorten it. Bear with me. Okay, hopefully you can see the screen and transatlantic communities, inclusive communities. So the DC region has a, let me go to the presentation mode, hold on. So the DC region has had a, a long conversation that the Coalition for Smarter Growth has been a part of from the beginning. And we also have great housing allies uh, working with affordable housing groups, affordable housing advocates, affordable housing developers, as well as private, other private sector developers uh, to change the direction of the region. And the commitment of the region is a network of transit oriented communities. Um, and everything ties to their 2010 region forward plan, something that we were instrumental in winning. And everything since then has tied to that, including their housing initiatives. Uh, they've made a commitment to bring another 100,000 housing units into the region in future planning because of the need uh, with a goal of a, a third of them being a affordable. They also have a goal of 75% of them be within these activity centers with high capacity transit. I'm sorry, 75% no, should be affordable was, was the goal. And here's some sign of where the activity centers are. Some of the outer ones are far too sprawling and spread out and don't have transit. So we focused mainly on those in the, the middle and inner suburbs as well as the city. You know before from my presentations that we have a national model in smart growth in the DC area of not just the city, but Arlington and its two metro corridors where Rosalind went from this in the 1970s to this courthouses in the foreground, Roslyn in the background. They've also have some uh, very good affordable housing policies for inclusionary transit oriented development. 
one of the comparisons, and this does relate back to the climate discussion that we're all having, there is a direct link between our housing equity and climate policies. So affordable housing in the right location near transit and jobs actually uh, also helps address our climate solution. If you compare Arlington, this is a busy slide, but the bottom line, if you compare Arlington uh, versus Loudoun, the greenhouse gas emissions per household are far lower. Lower, the amount of uh, driving is far lower. Um, so there are a lot of advantages from proximity to transit, to walkability, uh, to jobs, and to not being in the most outer sprawling areas. Um, the, that information came from the Center for Neighborhood Technology, which has a wonderful tool, which you should all take a look at. Uh, it uses census data, so I can't wait for the new census to update this, assuming they were accurate with the new census. Um, but go to this tool, put in your jurisdiction, take a look at it. At the key to this is that the combined housing and transportation costs shouldn't be more than 45% of your income. Now, typically, the farther out you go, especially if you're looking for affordable housing way out, you might not end up saving money because you're gonna, your transportation costs are going to be so much higher. So there are huge benefits and huge benefits in particular for lower income uh, people if we can provide more housing close to transit and jobs to minimize the transportation costs as well. We're worried that our, great, our most robust cities like DC, San Francisco end up pushing affordable housing out to less transit access, transportation accessible areas and increasing people's transportation costs. We're trying to transform the suburbs and Fairfax is a big focus of what we need to do in the Richmond area. It's certainly Henrico and Chesterfield. Uh, we've got huge sprawl problems in Hampton Roads, as you know, uh, but we have opportunities where we invest in transit. And this focuses on the half mile circles around metro stations, quarter mile around VRE commuter rail stations and the yellow or commercial corridors with their acres of parking lots, um, places like this. I mean, this is land not available for affordable housing, for walkable communities, uh, or for parks for that matter. And this is what our, too many of our suburbs look like. So we have lots of capacity for more housing and to transform the suburbs into medium density developments that are walkable. This is in the Route 1 corridor. And these are places where we want inclusionary zoning. Preservation of existing affordable apartments is a key part of it. Uh, here's one example. This is the King's Crossing area along the Route 1 corridor. We're starting to get redevelopment. You will see right in the center a mobile home community. And Fairfax did not adequately plan for preservation strategies as part of their new transit oriented plan for the Route 1 corridor called Embark Richmond Highway. So we're working with progressive groups there to figure out what is the mobile home park preservation solution or one for one replacement solution that provides equity to the, to the owners as this area uh, redevelops with the bus rapid transit line. And we're trying to create unwalkable, more commercial strip places like that in the lower part to more walkable and vibrant places in the upper. And if you have a luxury of choice like DC has in numbers of types of transportation, including very affordable bike transportation, uh, you are you know, creating a very great uh, competitive community with lots of opportunities. You'll know how important transit is from the, I'll go back for a second here, You'll know how important transit is by the fact that we've seen in the pandemic that bus ridership on GRTC has hardly declined at all. That bus ridership on Metro bus did not decline nearly as much as Metro Rail. Metro Rail dropped by 90% because it's full of white collar telecommuters. Uh, whereas our essential workforce are on the bus networks and how critical bus is as part of an affordable uh, living situation solution. So uh, the right place to grow are places where there are low vehicle miles traveled. You know, this relates to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and it also relates to affordability and where our affordable housing should be. We have some slides here and I'll go through these very quickly because it's a DC story. DC has been booming, as you know, and it's been adding a, over a decade, added a thousand people a month. As you know, it ended up with some significant affordability problems, and that's why a lot of our work there is on affordable housing strategies, which are strategies we can bring to other parts of Virginia. So massive increase in DC housing supply, big increase in permits, but much of the increase in higher priced units. And that's what we've seen in the big booming cities. The market's gonna try to build for those who pay the highest rents, of course. Uh, and most typically more affordable apartments that tend to be the older ones. And there's a cycle as they age, they become more affordable. But what we've had is a need to really produce more units at the middle and lower income range. And this is combined with the fact that high wages have been growing faster than lower wages. And many people are working in that area as well. It's a question of how much income you have and the minimum wage, et cetera. Um, 
uh, you know, we can show Urban Institute has some, done some great stuff, as has the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, about uh, you know where rents are growing faster than incomes, and where the where the sectors are that are most cost burden at 50% AMI and below generally. Um, and then here's showing where how the, the cost burden has has been rising. It all talk it all reflects the need to change our priorities, and that's a lot of what um, we're thinking about here and talking about is you know, we need to be investing in housing, a housing first policy. Um, there are helpful slides here. I will share them and get them to, uh, uh, to uh, RVA Rapid Transit and CCAN for sharing out with everybody so that you have it because I'm going through so quickly. But I think these are useful slides and a lot of credit to the housing picture goes to our policy director and affordable housing expert at CSG, Cheryl Court. So there are five pillars to the housing solutions we need in a transit oriented world. Preserve what we've got build new uh, using local, state, and federal funds, um, especially focused on deeply affordable housing, use your land use and zoning policy tools, but definitely increase market supply as well. On the preservation side, you need your housing preservation trust funds. You need tools like DC has, which sometimes are hard to get and will be hard to get in Virginia, but they have tenant first right of refusal and other tenant protections, uh, code enforcement. And you can also work on long-term affordability uh, covenants, limited equity cooperatives, housing land trusts like the Maggie Walker Land Trust in Richmond. Um, new funding, you know, the strongest force has been the low income housing tax credit, the federal one, uh, particularly as HUD has been starved of resources in general for years, for far too many years, and hopefully maybe we'll enter a year, an era when HUD can significantly increase what they, they do because nothing can beat what the federal government can supply in housing uh, funds. As you all know, there's talk about a state low income housing tax credit, which can be a good idea as long as we think it's targeted towards you know, transit accessible locations. Uh, having local housing trust funds, Richmond now has one, uh, jurisdiction in Northern Virginia do, but those could all be funded more. And honestly, I was gonna be skeptical, but the Amazon fund actually seems to be making some sense. We met with them just this week, Cheryl did, and uh, their Crystal City um, for a few hundred units, they're talking about 99 year affordability at 75% uh, of the units at 80% of area median income below, but 20% of those at 50% area median income below, which is significant for a private initiative. Hold on, I lost my cursor, there we go. Um, Portner Flats is one of the great projects we have often featured. It has a market rate building next to the affordable building. In this case, unlike the New York City terrible poor door case they talked about, here the tenants who had first right refusal wanted their own building. And they got their own building, and here's the mayor clipping uh, uh, the ribbon there, and that's on their rooftop party deck, which they have just like any other building in D.C., computer centers and so forth. It is a beautiful, beautiful building, as you can see. Uh, and that was made possible as a public-private partnership on uh, uh, public land in D.C., uh, uh, an affordable uh, a housing complex, public funds, a mix of private funds as well. Um, it's the public that really has to focus on the 30% AMI and below. Um, uh, public housing rehabilitation and expansion is a major issue. It's a big, um, a big issue in, um, in DC. Again, I'm going through quickly, but you'll have availability of slides. Land use tools, the biggest one we talk about is inclusionary zoning. It is a big debate in Richmond right now. Um, uh, there is a, a new law from last year written by the home builders on inclusionary zoning using bonus densities. Some say it is too inflexible and that is possible and that's under code section 15.2-2305.1. There is a more flexible code section 2304. We're looking at how Richmond can adopt these uh, and um, one of the challenges in, in Richmond we have with the Richmond 300, it's a great new comp plan, is it didn't make strong enough tie to inclusionary zoning. And so some of the amendments that Richmond for All, Partnership for Smart Growth and Asking For are some to the Richmond 300 would tie rezonings into inclusionary zoning. DC deserves uh, kudos. They have a goal of 36,000 new housing units, 12,000 affordable, and they're asking and making sure that every part of the city, including the wealthy uh, section to the Northwest part of DC, uh, are contributing and are part of that. And we have a yes in my backyard group that we work with up in the wealthy part of the of DC. 
and then market supply. And what can we do about that? More housing capacity, reform rezoning restrictions, and this is a good tee up for the delegates presentation and, 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 on, on, and so forth. Um, and then you know, reducing parking requirements among other things. DC, we're pushing for more housing in the DC comp plan, which hasn't been adopted yet. Now, let me step to very quick introduction to some of the other things, another tee up for the delegate. Uh, accessory dwelling units are another piece and tool in the toolbox. It's not a huge supply piece, but Portland, Oregon is doing 500 units a year. It can be a huge help. Backyard cottages, basement apartments, and so forth. Uh, the range of missing middle, this is one of our favorite slides about missing middle, uh, showing all the types of housing, a lot of it in the middle here that we haven't been building for a while as we ended up with a lot of single family zoning. But our older uh, streetcar suburbs used to have this sort of missing middle. Um, uh, townhouses, triplexes, uh, duplexes, garden apartments, and so forth. And that's what we're trying to find ways to encourage, cajole, incentivize uh, local jurisdiction to do more of. There is a rural context. I was just talking to our parent organization at the Piedmont Environmental Council. You know, the classic case of an environmental group that is deep into housing policy now, and they've been working on it, not just from the planning and zoning perspective, but how we provide more housing in, in the towns of, in cities of Warrington, Charlottesville, et cetera, and partnering with um, groups like the Windy Hill Foundation, which is bring, building a lot of affordable housing in the rural context. We have a problem out there because wealthy people are going out and taking up the tenant housing as second homes um, and uh, bidding up prices and so forth. So it's a rural challenge as well. Our housing first agenda in Virginia has to be housing as our most critical infrastructure investment. It's more important than any highway project, I can tell you. We actually should find ways to shift funding streams from highway construction to housing, expanding our housing trust funds. And we have to figure out how to strengthen inclusionary zoning and how to address missing middle and getting greater housing diversity uh, in Virginia. Uh, it's about all of us, it's about our future. Um, you know, and a future together. Um, and we can't do that without strong inclusionary affordable housing policies. So that's it. Thank you all. And I will stop sharing. Hold on. And there you go. Thank you, Stuart. Um, and now, yeah, we'll transition to you, Delegate. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? Uh, hope everybody is safe and sound away from uh, the effects of the pandemic, first and foremost. Uh, I know it, 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 it all kind of floats in and out with, um, uh, with all the craziness that's going on, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, we're, almost, we're almost through uh, that part, as well as uh, the problems that we are having in our democracy, uh, hopefully, in the next few weeks. So uh, definitely an important point to, to start with. And uh, appreciate all the work that RV Rapid Transit and uh, uh, CCAN is doing, as well as Stuart with uh, Smart, uh, uh, Smart Coalition, for, uh, Coalition for a Smarter Growth. And uh, I'm really grateful for that presentation. Actually, I'm always learning something new uh, from Stuart. Every single time uh, I, I jump on any uh, webinar or anything that has to do with Stuart, really. So uh, an encyclopedia of information and uh, uh, a youthful one too. So I really appreciate all of that. And uh, I'm gonna start uh, sharing my slide. And let me try to figure out this correctly. All right. Cool, great. So what does housing look like in Virginia? Is a question I think a lot of people uh, uh, are, are always thinking about in Northern Virginia, particularly in my neck of the wood, uh, because of the need uh, to reduce the cost. That's the number one thing that people think about uh, off the top of their head. Oh, it's too expensive to live in Northern Virginia. And that's not just Northern Virginia. It's really all across Virginia uh, because it's all relative to your income level. Uh, and the income levels are all uh, over the place, all across Virginia, uh, of course. And uh, so we got you know your 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 poorest neighborhoods, but also your wealthiest, and they all have the same problem. Uh, and uh, and it's just a little bit about myself. Uh, for folks that I have not met, I'm son of immigrants. I grew up in Chicago, so I saw a lot of good housing growing up. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, 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 you know three-story apartment buildings with six uh, apartments in them. I saw a lot of 
uh, high rises uh, that are all affordable, not uh, the high rises that are really expensive uh, in the fanciest parts of Chicago. Uh, you can get something for $500 a month to live there. Uh, that's unheard of uh, in, in Northern Virginia, at least. Uh, uh, my family was forced to uproot and relocate uh, to uh, Jordan uh, due to targeting by the Bush administration at the time of my father who, for, for being politically active for marginalized communities. Uh, but I'm back. I worked hard. I came uh, uh, to American University in DC, graduated political science, and then went on to become a dentist. Uh, so a little bit of a world of things there. Uh, just to put at you. And now I represent uh, specifically Herndon, Sterling, Chantilly, and Reston in the Virginia House of Delegates. Uh, a little bit about the area. Uh, 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 my area in particular is uh, actually some of the better off areas in Northern Virginia uh, with regards to housing availability, uh, affordable housing availability to be specific. Uh, my, uh, my district is 41% uh, born outside the United States. It's 23% Latino, it's 11% uh, African-American, it's 19% Asian, it's uh, the other category is significant as well. Other percentage is about 14, 15%. Um, what I'm painting here is a very diverse community in a generally well-off area. Uh, we have two metro stations opening up in the next few years. Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully this year. Uh, but I'm just giving the caveat now these days because they keep delaying the opening of the metro stations along the Silver Line. Uh, we have uh, bus routes. We have uh, two major uh, highway arteries, the Dulles Toll Road and the uh, Route 7 uh, State Road. Um, of course, not too far off from, from the Beltway. And so I, we consider ourselves a, a community that's very rich in resources uh, that have to do with uh, 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 with transportation, uh, and in the subsequent, subsequently, there's also a lot of uh, a good housing around those, uh, or a good zoned housing around those areas, and there's more to come. Not obviously, this is all relative. The whole region as a whole is lacking, as you heard fr from Stuart. Uh, and uh, you know, I think I think a, a little bit of a, a, a primer before before jumping into kind of the, the, the focus that I've found from the lack of affordable housing, as the years have passed, I've been able to, no, to, to notice how much it affects people on the margins. And, and this goes to the question of equity, is uh, you, we know for a fact that your zip code determines a lot of things. Your zip code determines your ability to get a good education, to get have good uh, uh, resources around you for, uh, 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 social, from social services to, to food, uh, to, um, uh, to just uh, restaurants, you know, the things that make your day-to-day -day life uh, are impacted greatly by where you live. And uh, specifically, I think the greatest resource that the public has to offer that uh, is underutilized with regards to uh, uh, creating equity is uh, uh, the, the resources that we put into transportation. We put a lot of money around trans into transportation as governments, but it seems to be in Virginia that the benefits go to people uh, at the top of the economic ladder in Virginia, that the, uh, the large majority of transportation uh, 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 services are not targeted for uh, uh, for people on the margins to be able to prosper. Uh, we know people of color have much less uh, uh, home ownership rates. We know that uh, they have uh, higher levels of stress. Uh, we know that they drive more on the highways. Uh, and, uh, and that's all uh, contributing to this lack of equity uh, that is at play here in our neighborhoods. We maybe are in more initial phases compared to other metropolitan regions in the country, as far as uh, uh, seeing the, 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 the depth of inequity that exists as a result of, uh, of, of where one lives. And uh, we are gonna, as far as, uh, as much as, as, as time passes, this, this inequity is gonna continue to expose itself. It's gonna become uh, bigger and, 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 and more uh, clear to the public 
I'd rather not get to that phase. And so that's where my work is as a legislator is to make sure as much as possible that we do all we can from state government to local government and all the way up to the federal government, whatever we can get to make sure that the cycles of segregation, modern day segregation do not play out. And that directly ties into uh, 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 structural changes that need to happen in zoning. So specifically inclusionary zoning, uh, uh, that is something that I focus on a lot is to make sure that we can put inclusionary zoning into law to legalize, to make as much as possible legal uh, and, and furthermore to make illegal uh, 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 bad zoning, make good zoning legal and bad zoning illegal. And it sounds like something that, um, you know, that, that, that wasn't allowed to happen before. Legally speaking, it is allowed to zone inclusionary zoning. What, what we mean by inclusionary zoning is to zone for more people to live in a single area. But localities have for the longest time geared away from that. And so that's where state government should be coming in in, in, in fixing the problem. However, we're, there's a lot of dynamics at play with regards to local control over authority that are needed to overcome that many of you may have witnessed in one way or another in different contexts. We need to be able to fight as much as possible to make sure that zoning is inclusionary at the local level when local officials are not willing to do it themselves to the extent that is needed. And that's where it becomes a necessity to legalize inclusionary zoning of all kinds, really. But we have to start somewhere, and that's where I'm starting off here. So last year, I came in with two big bills that made a big deal all across the United States, specifically on the East Coast, and I was really happy to be a part of that exercise of engaging in the public to educate around inclusionary zoning. Those two bills were, number one, to allow anybody that owns a single family uh, 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 property, single family zoned property in the Commonwealth of Virginia to go up in zoning to a two family zone property. To me, it didn't sound too ridiculous. To a lot of people in uh, the work on the locality level, it's, that was a very big deal to them, that to shift away a whole zoning uh, 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 ordinance into another one automatically by right for the property owner. That received a lot of pushback on the basis of, uh, of, of local authority should stay in the hands of local authority. A lot of little things came up that didn't really, uh, uh, don't, should not be in the way of increasing density, of increasing inclusionary zoning mechanisms all across the Commonwealth, but they did. Things like parking requirements, things like uh, my school is overcrowded and what are you gonna do about overcrowded schools? Or what are we gonna do about, um, uh, the fact that there's going to be more noise in my neighborhood. Um, these are all uh, 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 either uh, things that the public is misinformed about, or in cases of, of racism, they are actually red herrings that are used to block out our ability as a community to build more homes for people that need it in areas that are desirable around the public resources that we put in place for many, many years, the infrastructures of transportation, right? So, so th that's, that's, that's how the reaction happened to that first bill. The second bill was very similar, except the difference was, is the second bill uh, was talking about accessory dwelling units in particular. So that's the part that uh, Stuart was referring to as teeing me up for. Accessory dwelling units in Virginia are known as granny flats. That's the term that's very popularly used great term to use. Sometimes it's actually a little ageist towards our grandmas, but regardless of putting the ageism aside, you know, that it's, it was, it's very easy for people to comprehend what a granny flat is, right? Everybody, uh, you know, needs a place for, for grandma to live or for their older folks to live. And that's basement. That's a, a walkout garage that was, was redone. That's a cottage that was built in the backyard on a big land that somebody has attached uh, in addition to their house lots of different flexible ways of going about establishing an accessory dwelling unit. And I got 20 co-sponsors on that. I gathered a lot of support from my colleagues. 
uh, it was bipartisan. I got a couple of Republican colleagues as well. Uh, and it was under the notion of that this is gonna help grandma, but also all these other things out there that are really important. This is to say that the way we approach the conversation around what types of homes we wanna build and how we talk about it is really important to the discussion at large, because there's a lot of insensitivities out there that we need to overcome to get to more affordable housing. And uh, I also received pushback on that one, same pushback, which is local authority should stand in the hands of the local authority. And so the bill did not make much uh, uh, progress in the legislature. However, this year I've taken a little bit of a different approach and uh, learning from the fact that there is a little bit of a close mindedness at play in the, the arena of, of zoning around more affordable housing. And uh, that that particularly rests on this concept of local authority should never uh, 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 be moved up to state authority, even if local authority has been failing for 50 years to meet the demands of affordable housing. And so this is the reality that I have to work with as a legislature who's coming in with a lot of these fresh ideas around how do we zone on a statewide level. A lot of other states have already started doing sta zoning on a statewide level. It's a relatively new concept, nonetheless, nationally speaking, but it is happening. In Virginia, we take property rights a little bit more <laughs> tensely, I should say, in, in my experience. And so I'm beginning to deconstruct that with the legislation that I'm putting in for, putting in, uh, for, this, for this coming uh, 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 regular session. And so that's, that's where I've been actually working the most, focusing on specifically uh, uh, trying to get together the groups to talk on a statewide level uh, about zoning. And so I engaged in the last year over, uh, over the course of last year with different organizations around the environment, around uh, 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 racial equity, uh, around uh, the purely, the, solely the topic of affordable housing or organizations that are dedicated uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 building up our, our worker infrastructure, labor unions. Uh, uh, I've been talking to the AARP there's a lot of different organizations out there that have little t that have fingers in the, in the in the issue that I brought together, and I said, how can we overcome the challenge of local authority saying that we shall be the dictating uh, uh, authority of all things that have to do with zoning? And so the first bill is to have an accessory dwelling unit work group, just to have a work group where everybody can sit together, and by the end of the year, has to come out with a conclusion on how do we legalize accessory dwelling units statewide. What does that look like by engaging the localities in the conversation and their representatives throughout the course of the year and in addition to all the advocates so that we can reach some sort of conclusion. This is, I want to stick this specific bill and focus on it a little bit more because it's critical that we get a breakthrough in the conversation on a statewide level that we can zone at the statewide level. Currently, there has not been any precedent for doing so effectively on a statewide level to zone through the state legislature. And so if we can break through that conversation, then we can start going back to that table again and talking about different parts of the conversation that need to be handled around land use. Things like uh, uh, the duplex bill that I was talking about, but also all these other missing middle housing types that you saw in the picture that Stuart showed. There's a lot of different types that are not legal and they're not been uh, had, they've not been uh, acted on. And so, we have to be able to break through the conversation first and foremost around localities accepting defeat around their fact that they could not zone properly over the course of the last 50 years and, and they still have the ability to do so and they can show up and act on it as effectively as they need to around inclusionary zoning requirements. But in the meantime, we're gonna make it easier for property owners to do the right thing on their own without the need to go through an approval process. So that's that's the, the basic concept behind it that needs to be driven home as much as possible. Um, I'm tackling the, 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 the smaller issues like uh, 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 putting making sure that parking requirements are not uh, considered as part of transit-oriented development in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the manner that it is right now. Uh, uh, parking requirements are, are, are inhibiting our ability to increase uh, uh, inclusionary zoning in the Commonwealth of Virginia around transportation. So that's that's the second bill. A third bill uh, I'm working on is uh, uh, something that uh, was mentioned, land trust banks, the Maggie Walker Land Trust Bank in Richmond. Some of you that are tuning in from Richmond may have heard about it. It's a great 
uh, 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 concept. It's a great uh, project that's in place that allows localities, specifically in this in the Maggie Walker Land Trust Bank, the city of Richmond, to purchase property and place it into a land trust bank after it becomes tax derelict, right? After it's met conditions of tax derelict, which means that the, the property taxes have gone way above and beyond uh, the ability of the property owner to pay, and, and now the property is falling in the hands of the locality. As a first right refusal to, to have that, so they can actually give it to a nonprofit that would then turn it into affordable housing. In doing so as well, uh, 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 hold back the process of gentrification as much as possible, uh, which, which, which quick happens a lot of the times when economic downturns are, are in place. So this is a very timely uh, piece of work that I'm working on to allow localities to have the option to create a land trust bank so that when these properties tend to start to go up on the market for bidding, land, uh, localities have the option to purchase at a dollar in court freeze, uh, 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 the property so that they can make sure that it's affordable, to make sure that the neighborhood of property is uh, values are preserved, that uh, there isn't this artificial uh, this artificial redu reduction in, 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 in price of a property that then accelerates the cycle of gentrification and creates all this problem. So all these things to think about with the looming eviction crisis coming up. Uh, and and that, so that's, that's the third bill that I'm working on. The fourth bill is a little outside the wheelhouse, but it's very important uh, still nonetheless to the conversation, which is uh, how we advertise our schools uh, online uh, there's a lot of uh, rating agencies that uh, that factor in a lot of racist uh, uh, concepts into their rating and tend to produce significantly different ratings for schools uh, uh, than that that, that than the ratings that the, the Department of Education in Virginia has put in place. So uh, intertwined a little bit with the concept of property value that I was just talking about. Obviously, we know that schools receive funding based off of the property value of the air, of, of the houses in the area or the taxes that are collected, I should say. Uh, from the properties in the area and, and, and whatnot. There's a lot of uh, intertwining of those two things together around school quality. And so we wanna make sure that the school quality is only presented by the uh, Department of Education and now no other entities in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So those, those are the things that I've been, I've been talking, uh, uh, that I've been working on. I uh, appreciate you listening in and I'm excited to hear any questions and thoughts that you all have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delegate Samira. Um, again, I just wanted to, because I didn't introduce myself in the initial, my name is Elle and I'm with CKIN and I want to extend a very big thank you to both Stuart and Delegate Samira. I, again, every single time, as you were alluding to, learn. Um, and now we have a couple of really great questions that were thrown into the chat. So we're going to start off with Lisa from Virginia Transit Association. I think it was directed at Stuart, but if you know the answer to this, look at Samira, please feel free to jump in as well. Um, but it's, do you have any insights into the transit-oriented development TOD housing tax credit that the HBAV is having introduced? Is there a patron, et cetera? Um, Stuart, if you want to take that away. I do not. And the question is maybe Wyatt Gordon does. He's a... Uh... <laughs> Terrific coordinator at uh, VCN on our, for land use and transportation <laughs> issues, and he's been a godsend to all of us who are advocates who can't track everything, and uh, I'll see what he can tell you. Hey, yeah, I try and track what I can. Um, haven't heard exactly who the patron is going to be for a low-income housing tax credit. We are, however, hopeful. Um, I think now is a really good time for people to get involved and speak with their local lawmakers about how that extra layer of a state level low income housing tax credit would be especially beneficial. We know the federal low income housing tax credit has been responsible for about 80% of all affordable housing that has been built over the last two decades. So if we can add on a wraparound state level uh, tax credit as well, that specifically is uh, boosting affordability, but is also really focusing beyond just affordable living, uh, beyond affordable housing to really adding in being close to transit, making sure that people have access to affordable transportation. That's going to be very critical. Um, we've spoken with the home builders and they've been very supportive of us doing that type of work. It's going to have to go through um, the state kind of bureaucracy. They set rules themselves. Um, so should the bill be passed, 
then we will get to join in. Um, supposedly the rulemaking process has been very amenable to the voices of people who really care about it. So that's where you might hear from us in a month or two saying, hey, we got the low income housing tax credit passed. And now we need to make sure that developers who build specifically in transit rich places are getting extra bonus points. So that way you have folks who get you know, 50% AMI units that also are close to transit. Otherwise you can see folks who, you know, you get a 50% unit, which can be a life changing event for low income folks. And now you have to move away from your neighborhood where you used to ride the bus everywhere. So now suddenly you need to find an extra $10,000 per vehicle to get everywhere. And you're actually worse off than when you started. Um, so, yeah, you'll definitely be hearing from us as that moves forward. Um, and hopefully we can get to a place where it is really a TOD affordability bill. Thank you so much for that answer, Wyatt. And for those of you that were on the previous one, you will recognize Wyatt's face. A wealth of information always. Um, Nelson, you want to ask the next one? Yeah, our next question is coming from William Teeples and it reads as follows. Um, for many neighborhoods in the city of Richmond, increased private development has led to an increase in property values uh, within higher property taxes on homeowners. Meanwhile, there are a lot of developers and investors that purchase vacant lots and abandoned properties and then don't develop them for years. Um, cities in Pennsylvania have adopted a tax policy called a split rate land value tax that penalizes landowners that underutilize parcels. Um, and the question was just whether this could be a possibility for Virginia. I can take that one. Um, interestingly, it was Attorney General Gilmore who issued a ruling, a, a Attorney General opinion, a couple decades ago now about um, whether that would be legal in Virginia, and he opined that it would be. Uh, Falls Church at the time, or no, maybe the city of Fairfax at the time was asking for that authority. It's also used in, um, I think, in Scandinavia in some places and in Australia. And essentially what it does is, uh, you know, you get your property tax bill and you see that there's a land value on there and there's a building value. And what it would do would be establish a separate rate for the land and, uh, and it would in start increasing the rate on the land while decreasing the rate on the buildings and improvements uh, such that, you know, if you were, you were to increase rates on the buildings and improvement, you're disincentivizing people from making improvements. And here, and by increasing the rate on the land, you are recognizing that the public has made a major investments in streets and transit and public safety and everything else that has a lot of value. That's why land is expensive in cities because of, because of the value that the public has created. So why not tax the land higher? And the thinking is that economically, this would result in people not sitting on empty lots, having an incentive to get a stream of income and convert it into affordable living uh, in, uh, units. Um, it, you know, unfortunately, it has not been adopted and outside of Pennsylvania, it really has not been adopted. There hasn't been a strong political movement for it. Uh, we made a run for it in DC years ago, um, but they felt like they had other to tools that they were using in terms of the way they applied the property tax. So I wish I could tell you more, but that's all I know is that one attorney general has said it is legal in Virginia and we could potentially use it, especially for our cities and towns. The one thing I will add on to that is that um, it was explicitly authorized in this last year's session. Um, Gen Senator Jennifer McClellan ran a bill adding Richmond to the list of localities that are allowed to introduce a land value tax. That requires Richmond to take advantage of that exemption, however. So this is where it's really important. Um, we, it's very clear to see why you know we have these huge movements in favor of things, and then they come crashing like waves on the sea walls that are our institutions and politics. So you have this huge swell of support from people who reached out to Senator, Senator McClellan to kind of start making that change. Now we need to start building up another wave of folks to do that at the city level. Um, Richmond, if you are a Richmonder, strategically has an advantage to be a beacon on a hill because we have a lot of legislators like Delegate Samira who aren't from our neck of the woods but who end up spending a month or two here every year. Um, so if you can get involved, it's, it's a good opportunity. I don't just say that as a Richmonder myself, but 
I've heard from more lawmakers that they understand the importance of fast, rapid transit because they have ridden the pulse just from being in Richmond and needing to get somewhere and wanting to drink and not wanting to park. Um, so if you can support something like a land value tax, reach out to your city council members and ask for them. I know council member Addison has been particularly interested in this and has just felt like there hasn't been the support for it. Uh, but he was actually the one who asked Senator McClellan to push for it. Um, a land value tax, as Stuart mentioned, would be huge. Um, this would be probably the biggest tool to help switch all of those obnoxious parking garages around the city in our highest quality neighborhoods like Scott's Edition and downtown. Um, it would just tax parking garages way more because you're taxing them for the value of the land, not the value of your ugly built concrete structure, um, which is far less valuable. So if you want to see more housing downtown, especially with all of our commuting patterns shifting, um, this is a really great proposal to push. And with a new council and some new energy, now is a good time to do it. Thank you so much for that ad additional information, Wyatt. And I, when we get to the next steps portion, we're gonna run questions for about five more minutes and then we will circle back to how you can immediately get involved. Um, and so thank you for leading off, but um, just, really quickly so we can burn through a couple of these. And if not, um, we'll forward over the questions to our speakers and in our little follow-up email, have your answers for those that don't get addressed. Um, but Charlie Grimes asks, how can proposals be framed so it does not incentivize greater suburban sprawl outside of growth boundaries in county land use plans? A simple authorize one more house on each parcel will lead to more sprawl in Prince William County. Prince William County, hello. Um, so, so uh, you know, first off, I will say that um, Prince William County is not unique, but it's probably on the rougher end of things. But their zoning, the way they've zoned their county, is is very uh, unsustainable, to say the least. And uh, they've had a lot of problems with the way they zoned originally. So, uh, we'd have to look at the way you know, what exactly you're talking about as far as sprawling into a new suburb. I mean, they, I think they've already sprawled uh, the whole county. And when I say sprawled, I mean it in the, in the most negative sense of the term, because what they've done is, is uh, and this is just me driving around in Prince William County, a, lot, a house on a five acre lot uh, with a windy road going around the properties in this very unorganized fashion. So it's already sprawled out. And so what do you do when something's already sprawled out? Well, you wanna stop the sprawl from continuing from the edge of where the sprawl is. There has to be a limit to where the sprawl is. And so that means you have to make sure that the new housing that is being built is built in areas that already have housing existent in it. So those areas that you're talking about that uh, you know have sprawled or would sprawl if there would be another additional uh, uh, house on that lot, I would say let's focus on the terms a little bit more because I think the terminology is a little confusing when we're just using the word sprawl uh, with regards to increasing uh, amount of houses on that property. It's already sprawled, past tense. So what do we do with the problem now that we have it? Is to make sure that we have good public transportation around those areas as much as possible and to make sure that more people live on those single lots. I will say in Prince William County, there's a lot of overcrowded housing on those lots that you're talking about. So if you ever drive around there, you'll see that there's a, lot, a huge Latino population that's there's three, four families living in one house on a five acre lot, but it's only one house on that five acre lot. So that's a really, really big problem also for many public health reasons. And I, I, I think we can get into it in another day, but uh, that, just giving the edges of the conversation just there. Um, I think, Elder, have we got time for one more question, do you think? Okay. Um, so this question is from Jamie Baxter, and it reads, uh, to what extent has the, villain, has the Dillon rule uh, been an impediment to local government's ability to craft local land use and housing policy that addresses racial inequities, um, such as, as well as TOD approaches? Um, Can I take this again? Yeah, yeah. And I'll follow up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, it, it, Dillon Rule is an easy reason to use in Virginia for localities to say that they're they're impeded by uh, the state and their ability to zone properly. It's unfortunately not uh, it's not true at all. Uh, they they if they ever want a tool, they usually get it. 
I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, yes, there are exceptions. I'm not going to say that they blanket get everything they want, but the Dillon rule is not what's standing in their way. What's standing in their way is local individuals who have outsized voices, who are, uh, who are most likely male, who are most likely white, who are most likely older. And they have preconceived notions of who should or should not live in their neighborhood. They make up all sorts of excuses. You've heard of them. You've seen them in videos. They're the loudest people in the room at the local elected level, uh, local local uh, 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 official level. They're the ones that show up at the county or city or town meetings and nobody else is heard. They're the only ones that are heard. They're the biggest impediment to local elected officials doing their job. And I don't excuse local elected officials because local elected officials are not elected by one or two people. They're elected by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And they need to be accountable to those thousands of people, not those few that have the time and the availability and the money to show up at a town or city or, or county meeting in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week. That's a privileged person. And that's why we spend so much time at CSG, you know, supporting well-designed projects in the right locations and affordable housing and, and inclusionary zoning. And, you know, we can also pitch that there are significant other benefits uh, to this in terms of everybody's quality of life, access to services and, and so forth. And that it's, you know, that uh, I love the one phrase, uh, I think it's neighbors for more neighbors came out of Minneapolis that there are advantages of neighbors for more neighbors for, for everybody. You know, there was a question as well about inclusionary zoning and that relevant, and since I know we're running out of time, let me just jump to, to, to talking about that. Um, the, uh, you know, mandatory inclusionary zoning as it's practiced in Virginia uh, requires that there be, you know, bonuses, that the, uh, the property owner be made uh, whole, that they not lose net money. So it can be done in such a way that it doesn't discourage housing construction uh, by by developers, but it also means that you have to retain your tools and power to do that. One of the challenges we have in the Richmond debate right now over the Richmond 300 plan and rezoning is that the city has been rezoning to their plans uh, and, and without retaining the authority or, or proposing that there be density bonuses in return for, for affordable units. Uh, and that has been authorized in the General Assembly. The home builders had the bill last year and it became code section 15.2.2305.1. Again, some people say it's a little too restrictive and we're gonna have to look at that. And then 15.2.2304 is more flexible and is used authorized by some of the jurisdictions in Northern Virginia plus Charlottesville. Um, but you know, inclusionary zoning is legal under the Dillon rule. It's, the authorization has been granted. It should be used by local jurisdictions, but it means you can't give away all the density through a rezoning, a public initiated rezoning up front. You've got to create an incentive for people to go to that. Uh, and Arlington has done a great job of using their site plan process as an incentive process for contribution of affordable units. Uh, so I, again, I think it's a good tool. Uh, Richmond needs to learn how to use it and other jurisdictions should use it as well. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. El, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for all of the great questions and thank all of y'all for coming out and spending your lunch with us. We really appreciate giving us your, your time. Um, I am gonna just quickly keep monitoring things in the, the chat and we'll make sure to send all of the notes over. Um, but just uh, wanna plug some like quick ways for you to get involved, things on the docket um, as we move forward. So number one thing that I have mentioned is um, CCAN alongside our partners at Virginia League of Conservation Voters will be hosting a lobbying uh, training, Lobby in 101. That will happen next Thursday, a week from now, same time, um, but it'll be from 12 to 2. The following week after that is at VCN's um, Conservation Lobby. Tell her um, Wyatt, and uh, that, that will be an amazing event. That's going to run from 8 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The following week after that, so January 28th, is going to be the Clean Transportation Lobby Day hosted by CCAN, LCB, and Sierra Club. And that will tackle a lot of 
similar things as we heard today um, in, in the TOD realm. Um, and then a couple more things just to be on the lookout for is there will be opportunities for like phone banking and email blasts and things like that about the housing specific policies that Delegate Ibrahim Samir, Samira mentioned in his presentation. And next month, we also intend to continue on with our series um, from our, our first one focusing on housing and um, next month hoping to um, address uh, electrification for public good. So what does that mean when we're talking about mass transit and, um, and electrifying that? Um, and something that we alluded to just in the last minute for those that are um, Richmonders, we um, have the unique opportunity where our um, RVA, our Richmond 300 master plan is out. Um, our partners at um, Partnership for Smarter Growth, the CSG um, Richmond uh, uh, affiliate, so we will send that all of this information out and it's being plugged in the chat as well um, in order to um, uh, tell your council member what sort of changes you would like to see um, inclusionary zoning being one of the top line priorities. And with that, respectful of your time, thank you all for joining us and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and a big thanks again to our speakers. Thank you all.